From November 14 through the 21st, 2012, Israel conducted a military operation against Hamas in Gaza called Operation Pillar of Defense. I'm Nevit Basker, Executive Director of Broader View, an Israel Resource Center. This presentation will provide some background on Gaza, Hamas, and the decade plus of rocket attacks on southern Israel. We'll look at Israel's and Hamas's strategies during the escalation, and finally we'll examine how this operation played out in the Western media. The Gaza Strip is on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea between Israel and Egypt. It is about 25 miles long and between 4 and 8 miles wide for a total area of about 140 square miles or 360 square kilometers. It's home to about 1.7 million Palestinian Arabs. The area was occupied by Egypt from 1948 until 1967 when Israel captured it during the Six-Day War. In 1993, the Oslo Agreement established the Palestinian Authority, a semi-autonomous regime ruling the Palestinian territories. In August 2005, Israel unilaterally disengaged from the Gaza Strip, withdrew its military, dismantled 21 civilian settlements, and handed the area over completely to the Palestinian Authority. Two years later, Hamas took over in a violent coup and has ruled the Strip ever since. Hamas, or the Islamic Resistance Movement, is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas's charter calls explicitly for destroying Israel and killing all Jews. It states that Israel will exist until Islam will obliterate it, that the only solution to the Palestinian problem is jihad, and that peace initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are all a waste of time. On its TV station, Hamas brags that killing Jews is a form of worship, bringing them closer to Allah. This is more than just violent rhetoric. Hamas has an army and is sometimes referred to as militants. But it has also been designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. and the European Union and has proudly taken responsibility for killing thousands of Israelis. During the terror war of 2000 to 2005, known as the Second Intifada, Hamas was responsible for dozens of suicide bombings in Israel. In August 2001, Hamas attacked the Sbarro Pizza restaurant in Jerusalem, killing 15 civilians, including seven children and a pregnant 31-year-old from New Jersey. In March 2002, the Passover massacre at the Park Hotel in Netanya killed 30 and wounded 140 others. In January 2004, a Hamas suicide bombing on the number 19 bus in Jerusalem killed 11. More recently, senior Hamas officials, including the Prime Minister in Gaza, have been quoted as saying things like, Israel has no future in the Palestinian lands, we will never recognize the Zionist regime, and Hamas was formed to eliminate the State of Israel, an entity that must disappear. Even after the November ceasefire, Hamas TV was broadcasting music videos with songs that said, destroy the throne of Zion and death to Israel. These are not nice guys, but Hamas is more than a fringe Islamist or terrorist organization. It is also the established government of the Gaza Strip. As we see, it isn't objecting to any specific Israeli policy or government or border. This is not a territorial dispute. Hamas simply takes offense at the very existence of Israel, and it has no ambiguity, no ambivalence, and no sign of moderation. Another favorite strategy of Hamas has been to shoot rockets and mortars into southern Israel, hundreds a year. They launched over 12,000 attacks since 2001 and increasing after Israel's withdrawal in 2005 from the Gaza Strip. In the first 10 months of 2012, before Operation Pillar of Defense, Hamas and other terrorist organizations fired almost 800 mortars and rockets from Gaza toward Israeli population centers. Many of these short-range projectiles have landed in the border town of Sterot in southern Israel, where almost every city block has taken a hit from Qassam rockets. But in recent years, Hamas has obtained more sophisticated and longer-range rockets from their patrons in Iran. Grad rockets have reached the port city of Ashdod and the city of Beersheba, and the newest Fajr-5 Iranian rockets have the range to reach even Tel Aviv and Jerusalem in the center of the country. 
By now, a quarter of Israel's area and almost half of its population are within rocket range. If a terrorist group were launching rockets from Mexico into an equivalent area of the United States, they could reach much of Southern California, Texas, and the southwestern states. Another way to look at the issue of range is the time from launch to impact. How long do I have to get to safety? Well, if you live in the border town of Sterot, that's only about 15 seconds warning. In Ashkelon or Kiryat Gat, 30 seconds. If you're in Kiryat Malachi, you have 45 seconds to find shelter. And in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, you have almost two minutes warning to take cover. To be clear, these rockets are not a military strategy. These are weapons of terror, not targeting anything in particular. They are just as likely to hit an apartment building as an open area, a school, a field, a factory, or a playground. They are aimed at population centers, at families, at civilian areas. Thankfully, Israel has made a massive investment in an early warning system, as well as building safe rooms in every home and safe zones in every public forum. The early warning system detects rocket launches from Gaza and sounds an alarm called Code Red or Red Alert. The Israeli Home Front Command has issued detailed instructions on where to go when the alarm sounds to a reinforced safe room in your home if it was built in the last 20 years or so, to a communal bomb shelter. If you're in an older building, the central stairwell is probably the safest spot away from windows and outside walls. If you're in your car, stop and get out. If you're outdoors, take cover. And depending on where you live, you may only have a few seconds to get to safety. What can you do in 15 seconds? Tie your shoelaces. Send a text message. Maybe go to the bathroom. If you're in Sderot, that's how long you have to get your family to a safe room or a shelter when you hear the code red alarm. Kids playing outdoors stop their game and run to the nearest secure spot. If you're in a car, get out, take cover. On a train, get away from the windows, protect your head. If you're in an open area, find something that will protect you. Even a piece of construction debris is better than being exposed. And if there's no shelter at all, make yourself as small as you can, cover your head. If you're a parent, protect your children. Because if a Hamas rocket hits your home, it will cause considerable damage. It will break a wall like a house in Beersheba that was hit on November 20th. It can enter through a window and destroy a balcony as happened to a house in Rishon Lezion also on November 20th. A rocket can go through a roof like one in Ashkelon. It will destroy a car. You don't want to be in that car when the rocket hits. You have only seconds to get to safety. One family wasn't so lucky. On November 15th, a Grad rocket fired from Gaza hit a building in Kiryat Malachi, killing three Israelis. Remember Kiryat Malachi? Residents there have 45 seconds from Code Red Siren to impact. 25-year-old Mira Sharf was one of those killed. She had three young children, ages four, two, and eight months, and was pregnant with her fourth. She and her husband had 45 seconds to grab the three sleeping kids and get to the hallway of the building. She didn't make it. The eight-month-old baby girl, Geula Sharf, was injured. She will be okay, but she will grow up without her mother. Besides taking cover when the sirens sound, what else can Israel do to protect its citizens from this daily bombardment of rockets? In addition to investing in an early warning system and in safe rooms and reinforced shelters, Israel has developed an air defense system called Iron Dome. Iron Dome is a mobile anti-rocket system, a joint U.S.-Israeli development that has proven quite effective on the battlefield. It identifies, intercepts, and destroys short- and medium-range rockets. The system detects rockets and artillery launches and monitors their trajectory, analyzing the threat to determine the expected impact point. If the rocket is headed to a populated area, then Iron Dome launches a radar-guided missile to destroy the incoming rocket. During the eight days of Operation Pillar of Defense, Iron Dome shot down over 400 rockets from Gaza, an unprecedented success rate of about 85% of those aimed at populated areas. On November 11th, Hamas fired an anti-tank missile at an Israeli army jeep patrolling the Israeli side of the Gaza border, injuring four soldiers. In response, on November 14th, Israel targeted Ahmed Jabari, the leader of Hamas's military operation in Gaza. Jabari was a committed jihadist and convicted terrorist. He had engineered the 2007 violent coup that brought Hamas to power in the Gaza Strip. 
He was also responsible for the 2006 kidnapping of Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit, who was held in captivity for over five years. Jabari also oversaw Hamas's weapons program, including its acquisition of Iranian-made long-range rockets. It is not an exaggeration to say that Ahmed Jabari was the Osama bin Laden of Gaza. An Israeli airstrike killed Jabari in a pinpoint attack on November 14th as his car was traveling in Gaza. Israel also conducted hundreds of airstrikes against other terrorist leaders, as well as their operational infrastructure. In pinpoint surgical attacks, the Israeli Air Force destroyed weapons factories, munition stores, smuggling tunnels, and rocket launching sites. They targeted Hamas training camps, command and control posts, and communications equipment. These were highly accurate GPS or laser-guided bombings of very precise targets, hitting a single car or a single building, or even one story of a building, going after well-defined targets while taking care to minimize other damage and casualties. This was quite a difficult task because Hamas put its rocket launchers right in the middle of residential neighborhoods near schools and hospitals and mosques. All told, over eight days, Israel successfully targeted over 1,500 terror sites, including 30 senior Hamas and Islamic Jihad leaders and almost 1,000 underground rocket launchers. While Israel was very carefully targeting military installations and rocket infrastructure, what was Hamas doing? They were launching those rockets from within densely populated residential neighborhoods. An underground long-range missile launch site in the Zaytun neighborhood of Gaza City was very close to a gas station, a mosque, and a playground, all within about 300 feet or 100 meters or so. Hamas even proudly broadcast these images on their TV station during the conflict. The Hamas terrorists were even intentionally surrounding their mobile rocket launchers with children, knowing that Israel would hesitate to strike back. This use of civilians as human shields is a Hamas war crime, just like their intentional targeting of Israeli civilians. So while Israel's civil defense issued elaborate directions to Israeli civilians on where, when, and how to take cover in the case of a rocket attack from Gaza, there was really only one instruction necessary to protect Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Stay away from Hamas terrorists and weapons. To make that point, the Israeli Air Force even dropped leaflets on Gaza neighborhoods warning of an impending strike. The leaflet said, in Arabic, avoid being present in the vicinity of Hamas operatives. So in addition to the very precise targeting of Israeli operations, Israel took extraordinary measures, warning leaflets, phone calls, even aborting airstrikes when civilians were spotted in the vicinity of a target. Compare that with what Hamas did to minimize harm to Israeli civilians? Nothing. On the contrary, they specifically and intentionally targeted Israeli civilians. They didn't even protect their own civilians, as you might expect a real military to do. Instead, Hamas cynically and intentionally put Palestinian civilians in harm's way in order to either avert an Israeli strike or to be able to claim afterwards that Israel killed or injured civilians. Palestinian civilians, including children, were not the only ones Hamas used as human shields. Another favorite strategy was to hide behind international journalists. The IDF issued a warning to journalists in Gaza to stay away from Hamas operatives and facilities so that people who are reporting the news don't become the news. In one incident, Jody Ruderan of the New York Times reported on November 20th that an Israeli missile hit a Hamas car traveling right behind a New York Times staffer in Gaza. Do you think it was a coincidence that the Hamas operative chose to follow closely the car of a Times person? Speaking of journalists, it seems that the media constituted a third front in this conflict, in addition to the Israeli home front and the airstrikes on Gaza. Some journalists simply refused to see Hamas terrorists for who they are, describing them instead as militants or even resistance fighters, or as innocent bystanders, rather than the genocidal Islamic terrorists they themselves pride themselves on being. In other cases, there were factual errors or intentional misreporting, some of it directly fed and manipulated by Hamas. A photo of a wounded child, for example, was posted by Hamas on November 14th to show how Israel allegedly injures Palestinian civilians. The only problem? The photo was in fact taken three weeks earlier, on November 25th, in Syria, not in Gaza. But serious journalists wouldn't be misled by such propaganda, right? Wrong. 
On November 19th, John Donison of the BBC posted a photo of an injured child with the caption, Heartbreaking Pain in Gaza. Well, guess what? The BBC had been duped. The photo was from October 28th, and the child on the hospital gurney was another casualty of the Syrian civil war. And if the strategy is to mislabel and misappropriate victims, then Syria isn't the only source. This must be the ultimate chutzpah. Remember Geula Sharf, the eight-month-old baby whose mother Mira was killed in a rocket attack on Kiryat Malachi in southern Israel? A tweet of the same photo describes the same baby as an example of so-called Israeli terrorism. But look at the rescue worker's vest. It shows the logo, the coat of arms of Kiryat Malachi. Here's another example from complicit, or more likely conned, Western media. In this case, it's Yahoo News. Yahoo posted a photo titled, Gaza's Children Caught in Crossfire. But what does it really show? Two Israeli children running to a bomb shelter as the code red siren goes off. There's even a political ad in Hebrew over the shelter. This photo was actually taken on November 15th in the communal settlement of Nitzan in southern Israel. On November 16th, Egypt's Prime Minister Hisham Kandil visited Gaza and called t for an end to what he called Israel's aggression. For dramatic effect, he was photographed holding a dead child. The victim was Mahmoud Sadala, a four-year-old boy from Anazla, a town north of Gaza City. But the IDF wasn't operating anywhere nearby when this child was allegedly killed. In fact, there were no strikes on Gaza during the entire time of the Egyptian Prime Minister's visit. It seems that the poor child was a victim of an errant Hamas rocket that either landed within the Gaza Strip, as many of them did, or else misfired at launch. This would not be the first time that anti-Israel activists with a complicit media have made a martyr out of a Palestinian child killed by his own people. Remember Mohammed al-Dura? He was the 10-year-old killed in Netzarim Junction in southern Israel in September 2000 at the beginning of the Second Intifada, and he became an icon of Palestinian victimhood and Israeli aggression. But it later turned out that he was in fact killed by a Palestinian gunman, not by the Israelis. In fact, nobody even has to be injured by anybody, not in Syria, not by errant Hamas rockets, and not by appropriating Israeli victims. Every Palestinian is a potential victim in completely fabricated and staged scenes if complicit foreign journalists are present. This is a phenomenon sometimes known as Pallywood or Palestinian Hollywood. A BBC broadcast on November 14th showed a Palestinian man supposedly injured or killed being removed from the site of an Israeli strike. But 30 seconds later, the alleged victim gets up, smiles at the camera, and walks off the scene completely unharmed. Even when they were not intentionally or inadvertently spreading mislabeled photos, misidentified victims, staged scenes, and blood libels, Western media still missed the basic story of this conflict. There were two different narratives or storylines playing out in the American and European press, and both of them were wrong. In one version, Israel is the aggressor, and Gaza, especially Gazan civilians, are the victims. In this version, there are no rockets, no terrorists, no Hamas charter vowing to destroy Israel. There are no code red sirens terrorizing millions of Israelis, keeping them within seconds range of bomb shelters. There are only Israeli attacks seemingly unprovoked and with no context. We know that is completely wrong. The other version appears to be more even-handed or balanced, the hallmark of objective journalism. In this storyline, Israel and Hamas are bombing and shelling each other, sometimes referred to as a cycle of violence or tit-for-tat. But of course, in reality, there's no cycle here. Pretending that the terrorists and their targets are somehow morally equivalent puts the war criminals and those who are acting against them in self-defense in the same category. Those who target civilians and aim at maximal death and destruction are not the same as those who protect civilians on both sides. The tit-for-tat story has a nice balanced appeal, especially when calling on both sides to stop the violence, but it too misses the point. The real point is that Israel was being targeted and after years of restraint stepped up to defend its citizens. The real point is that Hamas, after shooting at Israel for years, gets a free pass from the media when they complain that Israel is being the aggressor. Now that you know the real story, you won't be misled. Operation Pillar of Defense ended on November 21st in a ceasefire mediated by Egypt with support from the U.S. 
Hamas and Israel both agreed to halt the hostilities. But in fact, nothing had been resolved. Hamas is still committed to the destruction of Israel, and Israel is still committed to defending its citizens. So we definitely have not heard the last of this conflict. We have now examined the background, the context, the strategies, and the media coverage of Operation Pillar of Defense. We saw where Gaza is and what Hamas is all about. We reviewed the decade plus of thousands of rockets and mortars from Gaza raining on southern Israel with increasing range. We saw how Israel protects its civilians with bomb shelters, early warning alerts, and the Iron Dome missile defense system. We saw how the IDF finally responded to the incessant rocket fire with pinpoint targeted strikes on Hamas leadership and terrorist infrastructure. We saw in contrast how Hamas shoots indiscriminately into Israeli civilian areas and uses its own civilians for cover. And we saw how a misinformed or sometimes duped Western media portrayed Israel as the aggressor or both sides as morally equivalent. Please disseminate these messages broadly. For more information or to provide feedback, you can also visit the Israel Resource Center at www.broaderview.org. Thank you for being informed and engaged in this discussion.